presentations today. Um, so yeah, they invited me to speak here. I've sort of come along a path of a lot of knowledge that I've gained over the years about nutrition. Um, when I first moved here in 1990, I wanted to become a lactation consultant or you know support person in the community. There really were not a lot of doctors at that time who were doing that. So I started out by you know becoming a lactation educator. And I started doing a lot of lactation things in my office. And lo and behold, it kind of sent me down a path of this nutrition. And obviously, breast milk is the first milk, the first food, so it was, you know, it's very important still. Um, and I started to get very interested in how you get kids to eat healthy, the kind of questions parents were asking me about foods and, you know, dinner table sort of scenarios. And, uh, I've also done some research now, and I started working initially really in the childhood obesity field. And uh, our San Diego County Childhood Obesity Initiative, I don't know how many of you are aware of it, but we have received over millions of dollars of grants from the government to do a lot of work within the schools, create wellness policies. Um, we have a healthcare and leadership council that is working on getting farm to hospital foods. We also have a farm to school program people are interested in any of that, I would invite you to go to our San Diego County Child Obesity Initiative website, which is called ourcommunityourkids.org, and you can get lots of information. You're always welcoming people to come to different events and meetings and, and all of that. So we're very committed to trying to get the county as a whole to reduce the child obesity rates and try to work from the ground up as far as, you know, from young infants. We have a preschool to farm program that's also been piloted. So we're doing a lot of things with the initiative. And I've been part of the leadership team for, I think, five or six years, and I'm still part of the healthcare domain. So we do a lot of things within the hospitals and things. Um, from there, I was doing a lot of consultations in my office. I have a private practice up in uh, Encinitas. Uh, dealing with kids who are overweight, but what I started to really understand is there's a real kind of link between obesity and sometimes eating disorders. And that there are a lot of things. People sometimes eat out of stress, and people sometimes don't eat out of stress, right? So there's a lot of linkages here when you're really looking at the whole nutrition piece between obesity and eating disorders. And I, again, just started to do a lot more uh, consultations in my office, and the last little over a year, Center for Discovery opened up a residential treatment center facility. It's a six-bed inpatient or you know uh, inpatient kind of facility that is for teenagers with eating disorders. And we do also often sometimes even have binge eating disorders. Kids are overweight, uh, along with your classic anorexics and bulimics. So it's something that sort of brought me into this field from somewhere I started many, many moons ago. And um, so what I'd like to do is to share a little bit with you. I know most of you are into the mental health aspects and behavioral aspects, but I think for many of you, it would be really great for you to understand a little bit. I'm not going to go into a ton of detail, but just a little bit about some of the medical pieces, because some of you may be on front line seeing these kids and really recognizing when a kid could be in danger or something could be important. And so we're going to go through a little bit of some of the medical things. Okay. Sorry, the clicker doesn't work, so I'm going to be running all around here. Okay, so, of course, nothing wants to work. Okay, so I'm going to just move. Here we go. Okay, so this is actually a picture from New York of, of billboards that were right together. Now, what kind of message do you think this gives? Right, you have child obesity, you don't take it lightly, and then right underneath you have the app for McDonald's going on. And this is the problem with our culture and our society today, I feel, is that we just have a lot of mixed messages about healthy, about eating, about nutrition, about body image. And this is where a lot of the issues are sort of driven in my mind. Okay, so, you know, obviously with the whole child obesity crisis, it's, it's a concern that a lot of people have that, uh, you know, we are in the midst of a real epidemic and unfortunately what the concerns are are the increased healthcare costs. 
I'm getting teens in my office who already have type 2 diabetes because of weight and nutrition and lack of physical activity. Um, I just did a consult on a kid who's, who's 17 and I drew some labs on him. A normal insulin level should be under 30. This was 60, okay? And so I'm going to meet with him next week and go over his labs and explain to him that you are going to have child, you know, you're going to have type 2 diabetes if you do not change anything like that. Okay, so probably in another 10 years or so, this kid, uh, you know, will probably have type 2 diabetes if he doesn't actually make some changes. Um, the other part is exercise. And unfortunately, we have a society that has really made things very convenient for us as far as, uh, you know, we, we don't have as many, many walking friendly kind of neighborhoods. Um, most people drive, especially here in San Diego County, I think we're a very you know, highly drivable kind of society. And so unfortunately, I think a lot of this sort of just drives the fact that it's hard to stay active. And um, you know, having that gym membership or other things you know, makes, makes that easier, but still, it's something that just naturally, we're not getting the kind of activity we need to be getting. Okay, when it comes to um, just sort of sedentary activities, unfortunately with our children and teens, there's a lot of screen time. And in our electronic medical records in my office, we have a question that pops up, how much screen time does this child use? And I'm going to tell you, I always preface this in the summer, I go, I know it's summer, but how much screen time do you use? And I'm going to tell you, I have kids who will actually admit to me now they're doing four to five hours a day of screen time, recreation screen time. And, um, you know, during the school year, yeah, it could be less, but it is definitely a concern that we have. Okay. Um, and then also just sort of the, the choices out there. Um, fast food industry that came up and popped up in the 80s really changed the landscape of food. It really changed the landscape of what our kids are offered. I mean, what kid could you deny the Happy Meal with the toy in it, you know, when that came out? I mean, these are all cultural things that many, many children are growing up with. So this is, this is an issue. And what happens is our society actually rewards thin. If you look at media messages and things like that, we know that the celebrities and the pop stars and all these people are really driven by thinness. And yet, you know, our society really pushes things that don't make it easy to stay lean, right? I mean, we have sedentary activity, we have a lot of choices on our, our meals and our menus that don't really support the idea of healthy weight, healthy lifestyles, basically. All right, so where has this led us? And this is really, to me, sort of frightening, and I see this a lot in my own practice. First to third graders, 42% say they want to be thinner, okay? You have 10-year-olds, 81% are afraid of being fat. And teens, 50% of teen girls, 30% of teen boys use unhealthy weight behaviors to control their weight. So they'll skip meals, um, you know, they'll, they'll purge, um, they may use laxatives, you know, there's a lot of sort of unhealthy things that they're doing to maintain their weight. And American women, 80% say they're dissatisfied with their appearance. I love this chart. I don't know if anybody has read this book. It's uh, I'm Like So Fat. And this is a, a great book for families or anybody who is kind of into this. She, Diane um, Newmark has done a lot of research on Minnesota looking at what are sort of the challenges with kids growing up in the society and eating, okay? And what I like about it, it, it sort of gives you an idea that obesity and eating disorders are a spectrum of the same issues, okay? And so if we look at weight control practice, we have healthy eating, then we have dieting, then we have unhealthy weight control behaviors, and then we have full-blown anorexia or bulimia. Physical activity, you can have moderate, you can have minimal, um, you can have a lack of or obsessive physical activity, and this is also a concern with our anorexic kids. Um, and we call that anorexia athletica or female athlete triad is sort of how the description is for that. Body image, we have the spectrum of body image, either to acceptance to total, uh, you know, dissatisfaction with uh, body image. And then the eating behaviors can go from regular to erratic, binge eating to full <coughs> binge eating disorder. 
And then if we look at weight status, we have everything across the board here that you can see. So there's sort of a spectrum of things. And how our kids fit into these can be very interesting because I get some of these kids to say, well, I just want to be a healthy eater, right? Okay? And they're eating very healthy. But they're also cutting out every single sugar, every single fat. And they're basically going down that road of anorexia. And we, there's a term for this now. It's called orthorexia nervosa. That's kids who are people, not just kids, but people who are driven to excessive healthy eating to the point where it makes life difficult, all right? Life shouldn't be that difficult when it comes to eating. So this is what we see also. So if we look at what the uh, new criterion are in the psych psychiatric literature, we have the release of DSM-5. And so one thing that is happening is that the guidelines for fitting into anorexia or bulimia are, have been less stringent. So what we're going to see is actually a rise in the, uh, in, the, you know, in the identification of this disorder, okay? So they eliminated the actual ideal body weight. We used to have a number we calculate and we go, well, if they're this under that body weight, then they've been anorexia. Now they could be a normal body weight but still be anorexic because sometimes we see people who over-exercise and they may be, quote, a normal weight but they're doing incredible harm by spending four or five hours in the gym, okay, and getting stress fractures and other things. Um, so it really has sort of loosened what we're going to use to fit the criteria. Um, and also the same for bulimia. BN is bulimia nervosa, AN is anorexia nervosa. And so there's also been a relaxation of some of the uh, uh, criterion for this also. Okay. Binge eating disorder. This has been newly recognized. It wasn't recognized before, and it's uh, defined now as recurrent binging at least once a week for three months without other compensatory behaviors. In other words, they're not purging or they're not over exercising to compensate, as an example. And then this is something I actually, I, I love that they put this in because I myself as a pediatrician, I see kids like this. And this is what we call avoidant restrictive food intake disorder. So I have some kids, and I have to say, sometimes it's even toddlers we see this, where they just barely eat. You know, the parents are constantly telling me they don't eat. They may be below the growth chart, and um, they're just not gaining weight as should be expected. Now, obviously, as a medical doctor, I want to rule out some medical causes for this, but sometimes I don't find it. And, you know, sometimes it has to do with some parenting things going on. The parents are so intense around the mealtime that these kids start to restrict more. Has, has anybody ever seen this? Like a four-year-old, you know? You know, you tell them what to do, right? I tell parents this. You, you cannot force, you know, kids to eat and chew the food and swallow it, okay? So when parents are trying to be so intense around mealtime, sometimes we see this sort of behavior come back to bite them when it comes to their children. Okay, other additions, there's also uh, an, uh, kind of a otherwise non-specified sort of eating dis disorder. And this can include things like just really intensive dieting behaviors, eating food at unusual times, night eating can fit into this, compulsive exercising, and other obsessive kind of behaviors around food, and a lot of food rules, we call it. And I'm not going to go through all of these, but basically you can see here we have you know, it also fits into like purging, people can purge, um, and sort of some of the things that might not quite fit all the criteria for anorexia or bulimia, but it's pretty close. I mentioned already the orthorexia, so these are the kids who start out saying, I just want to be healthy, I want to be healthy. Um, Diabulimia, I have one of these who I followed, she uses her control of insulin to lose weight. So um, she controls her blood sugars at a very thin, thin line to try and maintain her weight at a low weight. Um, muscle dysmorphia, where they're basically just, you know, wanting to build muscles in certain spots. This is probably more significant in the males. And drunkorexia, where girls or boys also will not eat calories during the day because they know they're going to eat three calories at night. So this is um, something we hear about on college campuses, for example. <coughs> So what are the stats? Um, well, 20% of you have mental disorders, and many of you are in this field. 
Um, and many of them, unfortunately, are not getting the care they need. And this is really one of the, you know, one of the problems that we have when we're dealing with mental health disorders. 3% um, of U.S. teens that estimate probably have an eating disorder, but most do not receive treatment. And these statistics are probably, these are actually from about three years ago, and I was going to look up some newer statistics, but they're hard to kind of dig out, but I'm sure these criteria, I'm, I'm sure with the new criteria that we have, we have higher numbers at this point. And many of them have other psychiatric disorders, comorbidities. Um, for females, um, between 15 and 24, the mortality rate is 12 times higher than the death rate of all other causes of death. So as a psychiatric illness, this has got a very, very high death rate. We're also seeing increasing prevalence in males. Um, and uh, you know, I'll share one case with you. We had a 13-year-old boy who came into the yeah. office got some counseling by one of our doctors who showed him his growth curve and he started to kind of go up. So the doctor basically explained to him, well, if you keep going up like this, then you're going to be overweight and, you know, sort of make that sort of uh, talk on him. And lo and behold, in the next, I think it was about four weeks, he lost about 20 pounds. And he came in with a heart rate less than 45, okay? And, um, you know, just became at a very dangerous medical level. So unfortunately, sometimes from the doctor's point of view, we think we're creating some really good messages. You know, we, we want you to stay healthy and all that. But this kid, who as it kind of turns out, as you kind of get to know what was going on, has a high level anxiety and a little OCD. He just took that message and went with it and said, well, I'm not going to be that obese kid in two years. I'm going to lose weight right now. So he took it seriously and he lost 20 pounds. So, you know, this is the kind of danger that we have um, when we give some of these messages. And increasingly prevalent, uh, it's increasing prevalence in minority groups also. Um, Hispanics seem to have the highest rates of bulimia, whites seem to have the highest rates of anorexia. And what's perhaps most astounding is the rate of hospitalization of these kids. So the, from 1999 to 2006, it increased about 119% for children younger than 12 years of age, okay? So we are seeing some really astounding statistics of kids who are being hospitalized for eating disorders. And I don't know if you know, but down at Brady Children's Hospital now, they have a whole inpatient unit dedicated for eating disorders. So if you don't know about it, it's a great resource. Okay, so what are some of these risk factors out there? And I call it disordered eating because I think sometimes these are also risk factors for obesity also. Okay, so I want to put it in a picture of just abnormal eating habits. What kind of things are going on? Um, sometimes it's family functioning style. Um, you know, if a mother says to her daughter, you know, um, and, and the mother, I, I've had this too, you know, the, the mother who goes to the gym five days a week, she's very thin, she's very fit, she does not want her daughter to be overweight, okay? And I have had moms who have really driven their daughter, I had one particularly who drove her daughter into overeating and kind of a binge eating disorder because the mom was so adamant about how this kid looked. And she even promised her some designer jeans if she lost 10 pounds. I mean, the kid is in my office crying at age 14 about this because of the pressure that the mom put on, this kind of drive for thinness that the mom had. Um, you know, very high achieving. Some of these uh, kids and teens are very high achieving, very goal oriented. Um, a lot of time there's a lot of enmeshment with the families, with the mothers and the kids, and I'm sure you see this in you know, a lot of the mental health things that you're all dealing with. Um, if there's some sort of lack of conflict resolution, sometimes some of these kids develop these uh, habits and, and the disordered eating after a divorce um, because uh, you know there, there was a, a bad divorce or some sort of abuse or something like that. Um, I had one girl who I remember, the parents got divorced and she was very heavy. She was probably over 200 pounds as a teenager. But you could just look at her growth curve. When the parents got divorced, her growth curve just started to skyrocket. You know, So that's a big stressor for these kids. And sometimes parents who have that kind of overprotective style. And the, the personality traits, again, these are probably all really familiar to you. Um, you know, they're anxious or 
perfectionists, they can be obsessive, you know, they're people pleasers, they want to get, you know, approval from everything. Um, many of these kids lack coping skills, um, and, you know, they have a need for control maybe or attention. Um, fear of growing up sometimes. There's, there's this uh, what we call Peter Pan syndrome where some kid girls don't want to develop into a woman, right? So they try to arrest physically their pubertal growth by, you know, staying underweight and they, they realize that that's a waste. They won't get their periods, they won't get breasts and all these other things. And unfortunately there's a lot of social kind of cultural factors in this, in this arena. Um, movies, TV, magazines, unfortunately there's a lot of websites that promote anorexia, they call them pro-ana websites, so teens can get really involved with this and they start to learn a lot of the tricks of the trade from other, other people. Um, lifestyle, we've also seen that sometimes families who are really preoccupied with healthy eating and, and uh, exercise also have issues. You know, if a parent is constantly saying, oh, I need to be on a diet, I look fat in this, you know, that kind of thing, little girls, little kids hear these messages, right? And they want to they wanna please their parents. They may feel that that's something important. And then peers. Um, I mentioned kind of the drive for fitness among the peers. Some of these kids don't want to get over 100 pounds. You know, there's some shame to some of these kids in getting over 100 pounds. Or they're comparing their weights and they, they want to, you know, be smaller than their friends. You know, these kind of things can also go on. Um, personal factors can also be, as I mentioned, trauma, abuse. Um, sometimes kids have a special, teens might have a special event, prom. Oh, I have to lose 10 pounds. Well, they do it and then they keep going because they realize, oh, they get comments from their friends or family members. Oh, you look so good. You look great. And, of course, that only reinforces the message here. Um, sports pressure, and obviously some of these sports that are what we call kind of the aesthetic, aesthetic sports, like ice skating, gymnastics, dance, you know, you want to have the figure and the body to be able to do that. Some of these uh, uh, arenas will also encourage kids to sort of stop eating or try and, and really uh, have issues with their, with their nutrition. Just even state, statements by others. I can't tell you how many times sometimes in history uh, a kid who comes in with anorexia or who is overweight, they were told by somebody they were overweight and then they wanted to lose weight or, you know, somebody made some comment to them. And these comments stick with kids like glue, you know. They will remember those things. Um, bullying can also be an issue. And again, we've kind of talked about the family dynamics. Um, the psychological issues are rampant with these kids. And, um, we just see that sometimes the eating disorder becomes a coping mechanism for them to deal with their anxiety or their depression. So it becomes a way to control something for them. Um, so we often see kids with anxiety, depression, OCD, substance abuse. There's also a number of kids with Asperger's who seem to have a relationship with uh, eating disorders. So Asperger's is another thing. And it's interesting because we have some kids who come to us to our eating disorder house and the diagnosis of Asperger's hasn't really been made but as we sort of get to know these kids we start to realize you know what they probably fit into that high functioning kind of Asperger's kind of kid so it's something else to be thinking about. And you can see that the percent with comorbidities is pretty significant for most of these kids. And we really need to treat all of these issues if we're going to get to the bottom of this so we really really do need to treat Okay, so um, this is uh, an article, it was by Diane Newmark Stancer, who wrote that book, I'm So Bad. And um, it's one of the few articles that looks at prevention of obesity and eating disorders in adolescents. Okay, it's really one of the few articles written about that. So I wanted to just kind of talk about the five factors really quickly that she aligns with how these things might develop. One is diet. So, you know, people who go on a diet generally, uh, you know, as, as many people know, they may gain more weight afterwards. But the dieting mentality and families who constantly promote a dieting mentality within the household, that can actually align with more risk of obesity and more risk of eating disorders. Um, we know that this social impact of all these things, and girls who read these health and fitness magazines, for example, they seem to be 
more likely to have unhealthy uh, habits, unhealthy measures to kind of control their weight and things. So it's really something to consider when we're looking at how these kids are looking at dieting and how to be thin. The other thing out there is family meals. And unfortunately, I think this is something that's really sort of going by the wayside. Um, you know, that families actually sit down and all eat together. Um, much of this has to do with work schedules, but also schedules that are imposed on the family. Well, this kid's got to get to soccer practice, and this kid's got to get here, and this kid's got to go there, and so we're just going to pick up, drive through, and eat in the car because we don't have time. Or someone's going to eat when they get home at 9 o'clock. You know, so all these kind of things, unfortunately, can put us at risk for sort of eating issues in kids. And they've shown that frequent family meals, and there are several studies on this, can actually lower the risk in teens of things like smoking, drinking, drugs, disordered eating, depression, and being overweight. So it's a big question, I think, for you to ask your families, and I know some of you take care of young families, how often are you having a family meal? Are you really making the effort, okay? And, you know, and they also have better grades. So that is another, another thing to you know, they tend to eat healthier foods, there's more interaction going on, parents can monitor eating issues, so there's a lot of reasons why a supportive family environment and supportive family meals are helpful. Okay. But what we also know is that parents and kids are not really connecting a lot of times. And, you know, unfortunately, a lot of families watch TV while they're having their, quote, family meal. That's not a family meal, okay? That's not a family meal. And they found that the average parent spends only 38 and a half minutes per week in meaningful conversation with their children, okay? So this is why I think family meals are such an important thing for all of us to be promoting out there. This is a little slide. There's a, there's a whole movement towards what we call mindful eating. I know some of you who are, uh, you know, in the mental health industry, you know, we talk about mindfulness and mindfulness-based risk reduction and all these types of things. Well, Mindful eating has got to be part of this picture, okay? This is not mindful eating, okay? <laughs> so what do we need to do to create a mindful meal? Well, sometimes we have to set a goal with our families and say, how many times can you commit to having a family meal a week, all right? If it's zero, can we go to two or three? You know, what, what is realistic? No TV, no phones, no texting, okay, while you're having a family meal. And it drives me crazy when I go to a restaurant and I see a family all around the table and every one of them is on their phone. And nobody is even looking at each other or talking to each other, okay? Involve the kids in planning meals. You know, parents have really gotten away from that. We've gotten used to just catering, get the job done, let's go, right? Go on to the next thing. But I really encourage my parents, have your kids learn to plan. Have them teach them how to cook. You know, grow a vegetable garden. I mean, all these kind of things really encourage kids to have ownership about what they're eating. Um, eat slowly. Um, this is something I teach a lot of my kids to do. You know, chew ten times before you swallow the food. Put your fork down in between taking a bite. Because some of mine, especially this has been shown in overweight kids, often they're very fast eaters. So we really want to teach them how to slow down with their eating. Involve all the senses. When I'm teaching parents about their picky eater, you know, four-year-old, I say, you know what, don't expect them to eat that, you know, green bean. Just have them smell it or lick it or listen to it, you know? I mean, engage them in other senses, especially this works well with young children, before you get them to eat and taste it. And we never want to force them to do that. I mean, uh, Alan Satter, who's done a ton of work in, in eating relationships with uh, young children, her uh, division of responsibility uh, sort of rule goes like this. It says, it's a parent's job to pick and choose what to offer. It is a child's job to pick and choose how much and what of that to eat. Because when we start overriding that and trying to force kids, that's when things start to go wrong. Okay? Um, avoid portion distortion. I mean, I get a lot of parents, they think this much is a portion, and sometimes we get a little into that because we're used to going to a restaurant where you get really, really large portions. So well, parents sometimes have really high expectations of how much food their kids should eat. And also keep the meals pleasant. I tell parents, 
Use family meetings at a separate time other than meetings to discuss family issues. Do not use meal time and make that an unpleasant time for our kids and families because it really should be more about enjoying each other and uh, enjoying the food. All right. Um, the next uh, thing that we see from uh, Diane's work is just weight talk and weight teasing. And I kind of put them together because they're pretty similar. I mean, weight talk is comments from family members about their own weight or other people's weights, comments, you know, about their own weight. And, you know, to, to criticize a 10-year-old uh, a about the weight can be very, very harmful when it comes to a parent, or it comes to a kid, when it comes from a parent. And st several studies have found that this kind of weight talk, whether you're encouraging your child to diet or talking about their own <coughs> dieting, can actually lead to some of these problems. Um, interview with uh, parents in recovery from eating disorders found that weight talk impacted them negatively. Um, I recall one girl we had in our facility who her whole eating disorder started at 12 and her mother wanted her to do this LA weight loss diet with her. You know, a 12 year old, she wanted to put her on this diet. Well, the kid said no way, she rebelled, but then she decided a couple months later she was going to do it her own way. So she started restricting and over exercising, and that's how she, she did this. Um, and we want to focus on helpful eating behaviors, not weight control behaviors. So if you're offering healthy foods and you're making that the message, and it's not because we're here to lose weight and we have to eat this certain way. Weight teasing is the other issue. It can come from other family members. It, it, you know, I sometimes get siblings who can be very cruel to their siblings about their weight. Uh, and also, obviously, from other uh, kids. So this is where the weight teasing comes from. And we see, interestingly, that the weight, uh, the, the reports of teens being teased actually happens about weight, even if you're normal weight, OK? So kids can get teased because they're underweight, overweight, normal weight, you know, so the kids just tease. And this is what the statistics show, that it really doesn't matter, you know, they're all getting teased about, about their weight, and how many kids are. And the last factor that she talks about is body image. And um, she says half of, of girls and a quarter of teen boys are dissatisfied with their bodies, and these numbers are actually obviously higher in overweight teens. And this is a risk factor for both um, eating disorders and disordered eating. Okay, so these are other things to consider. Okay, so I'm going to just quickly kind of go through a little bit about the health issues because I think that this is um, something, again, probably all of you, and I don't expect this to be like a training round for you, but just so you hear once what kind of things we worry about in the medical profession as far as, you know, this goes. So, the first thing is, you know, take your history um, and, you know, changing eating habits, um, skipping meals, withdrawal from friends. You know, some of these kids will have excuses of why they don't want to eat with the family or eat out. That's another common one. They don't want to eat out because they don't want to be, you know, shown all these choices. Um, sometimes you'll see these food rituals. They'll label read. They can calorie count. They can, they'll drink tea. They'll chew gum. There's a lot of different rituals around eating disorders that can come out. Some of these um, kids are taking laxatives or they're using diuretics, things to make them lose water weight, okay? And um, some of these kids also use uh, diet pills. Um, get a history about the physical activity. I mean, a kid who's going to the gym and doing, you know, two hours of cardio, that's not really normal, okay? If that's a routine, you know, three to you know, some of these kids that we see, you know, that's their routine six days a week, seven days a week. They go crazy if they can't exercise and do their one or two hours of cardio every day. And I have, I, we've had a couple kids who have been admitted who go to the gym twice a day for two hours each time, you know. And so this is the kind of thing that we'll see when we're taking the physical activity histories. Um, notice weight fluctuations if you, if you see that. And what's interesting is we do get some normal weight kids who are really anorexic or they're doing over exercising as a way to control their weight. So you really do want to look for that, but it's not always the main, main factor. Um, the girls are uh, looking at menstrual cycles. Two to three months of missed cycles is often a red flag for us. 
that maybe there could be something going on with restriction and things. You know, normal weighted kids who don't have an eating disorder, you know, their first year or two often of having their periods are often very irregular. That's not actually that unusual. But a kid who's been super regular and then suddenly stops and has lost 10 pounds, that should be a red flag to you. Um, and if any girl has greater than six months of no period due to restriction of eating or over-exercising, you should really consider doing a bone density test on them. And that is to look for osteoporosis or low bone density. And some of these kids who over-exercise or have eating disorders often get stress fractures too very easily. So that should be another tip off if you're getting a kid with a lot of stress fractures is there something going on. And then, this is just more for your reference. I mean, you can read all these kind of review assistance questions, but, you know, eating disorders unfortunately affect the whole body. You know, that uh, with kids who are purging, you can get dental cavities. Sometimes it's the dentist who will discover that a kid's been purging because they'll examine and often they get cavities on the inside of the mouth because of the acid coming up, okay? They'll have heartburn. Um, so these are things, sometimes they'll have cracked teeth. Sometimes they use objects to actually make themselves purge. Some kids use their fingers, but they might actually crack their teeth or injure a tooth doing that. So those are some things to think about. Um, and, uh, you know, again, this is just kind of more for, you, for your reference. When it comes to the neuropsych, again, many of you are probably familiar with this, but um, the concentration, memory loss, again, we talked about depression, and self-harm, you know, is a big thing with a lot of these kids. We've got a lot of kids with self-harm, suicidal ideations or attempts in their history, so it is something else to be aware of. When it comes to what we have to do in the office, and this is something I actually have to kind of train a lot of doctors on because it's not something that I think comes naturally to staff in an office, okay? Patient comes into a medical doctor's office, the nurse throws the kid on the scale and tells them their weight, right? Pretty normal. But these kids, we have to do what we call a blind weight. And on, in my charting, we have pop-up notes that come up, do blind weight, because I have these kids kind of tagged. Because when they step on that scale and they see they, they gain two pounds, guess what? They start freaking out. Or they have a number, a goal, that they want to be on a weight. So, um, I mean, there are a few exceptions to some of our eating disorder kids who don't need a blind weight, for, but for the most part, they shouldn't know their weight, and it shouldn't be discussed, all right? So it is something we kind of uh, work to do. And I encourage my parents to get rid of scales at home, because the kids will secretly find the scale and weigh themselves, or the parents sometimes are weighing them. I've, not, I've had that happen, too. Um, you should be able to need the height also to calculate the ideal body weight. Again, I just referenced it on the bottom, how to do that. And the other really important thing with these kids is to do orthostatic blood pressure. So they need to be lying down for five minutes. Five minutes. Quiet, all right? And not getting up and down, but laying completely for five minutes. Then you take their pulse and you take their blood pressure. As you know, it gets lower when you lie down and you rest, right? But it becomes a little more realistic reading for us as to how slow their heart is going because this is the one really important thing that we look at medically as far as, does this kid need to go to the hospital or not, okay? Now, here's the argument I get. I get some of these kids that come in, they have an eating disorder, maybe they're over-exercising, go, oh, I have a low heart rate all the time because, um, you know, I'm an athlete, right? And they're way underweight, and you look at them and you go, no, your heart is like a weak, bad, of uh, muscle that is working right now. And it's barely working because it's trying to save energy. An athlete, if you were to do a scan on their ultrasound on their heart, an echocardiogram, would have a really thick muscle, okay? That heart is working very efficiently. These kids will have very cold hands and feet because their perfusion, the blood flow to the extremities is very, very low. So that's the difference with these kids. So you need to kind of explain that. And we also look for um, blood pressure changes and pulse changes from lying to the sitting. Um, another thing I usually do is I'll get a urine on these kids. Because sometimes they come to my office, they know they're coming to see me for an appointment, and they drink five cups of water before they come in. Because that weighs a pound or two. So they're going to they're gonna over what we call water load before they get their weight, okay? Or some of these kids can be very concentrated because 
they're not drinking enough fluids. And um, that can also affect blood pressure and heart, too. So we have to just kind of understand all those things. And the temperature. Some of these kids can actually have very low temperatures also. Okay. So we're going to just wrap up kind of here with sort of the treatment and what we call sort of the levels of care that go on. Um, when it comes to a kid with a very low heart rate, and what we look at is generally in pediatrics, a, a resting heart rate less than 45 when they've been lying for that five minutes, I'm pretty much kind of calling Children's Hospital and seeing if they have a bed. There's a few exceptions. There's a few kids who I've followed a little under 45, you know, because the parents are there, they're eating, the kids are motivated, you know, whatever. There's definitely some, some room there. But that should be a really really big red flag for somebody that they need daily follow-up and you know this needs to be taken quite seriously okay um, if they're very underweight under 75 percent of ideal body weight these kids generally will need to go into the hospital because you can't just feed them 5,000 calories in a day and say oh you're gonna you're gonna get better if you just eat all this because they're really at risk for something called refeeding syndrome where they can actually overload the organs with too many calories so it has to be done, the refeeding has to be done in a very controlled manner with um, electrolytes and other things being followed closely while they're in the hospital. Um, some of these kids get hospitalized because of other symptoms. You know, maybe they're a suicide risk and they can't contract to safety. Um, if, you know, in our center, if a kid refuses to eat for 48 hours, you know, and we're going to end up sending them down to children's because they're going to get an NG tube to make them get the calories. Um, residential, that's like the facility that I'm at, and so this is basically where you have counselors. Uh, it's going to be similar to here. You have counselors, we have nursing staff that comes in twice a day, we have a psychiatrist on staff and myself to look at all medical problems, a psychiatrist to look at the psychiatric med issues. So we have a team that really works to try and get these kids in a place where they can hopefully step down into uh, a uh, lower level of care. Um, the next l lower level of care is often partial hospitalization program. And we do have a couple spots in our facility for that. So these are kids who are there from like 9 to 5 or 9 to 7, 5 to 6 or 7 days a week sometimes. And there's other PHP programs also. Um, uh, UCSD also has a eating disorder program and they have a PHP program. And then there's intensive outpatient. Most of these are after school programs for our adolescents. And um, again, you have usually group sessions, a dietitian, therapist. They often get to eat one coached meal with the group or with the dietitian. So, you know, there's various ways that they try to support them there. And then probably the um, simplest or lowest level of care would be just sort of having a team, an individual treatment team. And usually it should include a medical provider a psychologist and a dietitian, and possibly a psychiatrist if they also have other comorbidities that need that attention. Um, I already mentioned this, eating disorders have a very high mortality rate. We need to take this very, very seriously. Um, I tell kids and families when I'm first working with them with their eating disorder, it's like cancer. We want to get it early, we want to treat it aggressively, okay? You don't want it brewing for five years. Because if it does, that kid has a much lower likelihood of actually getting, quote, recovered. And um, so we want to try and really take it seriously right from the beginning. Um, you know, and it's unfortunate because sometimes insurance doesn't quite recognize that piece. And that's where we always struggle is with the insurance piece to, you know, who covers this, who pays for it. Do they agree with us that this kid needs that level of care? Um, and then I just want to end with a couple things on the interaction between overweight and eating disorders. I, I kind of alluded to this already. Um, most adolescents who develop an eating disorder were not overweight, okay? Studies seem to show that. There are a small number who are. And often they start with just eating healthy. Um, but there are some adolescents who can go on to get an eating disorder. But I'll tell you one of the challenges is it's often missed, often missed because the health professionals or other people don't really see it as a problem. Of course we want our kids to be healthier. If they're really overweight, it's good for them to lose some weight. Yeah, that could be true. But how are they doing that? What are the 
behaviors that are going on to do that. How quickly are they losing the weight? You know, we need to really be in tune with that and identify that. Um, and, you know, again, be aware of those kind of rapid weight changes, change in vital signs, and, you know, what other kind of ways they're doing to do this. When we're working with um, kids and teens, a few messages. Um, I try to give health professionals. Many of you are already familiar with motivational interviewing. Um, it's something that, uh, fortunately, I will say a lot of doctors are well trained in it. I've done a little bit of training. I'm not going to say I'm an expert, but it is something I try to incorporate and use. Because if you go in as a health professional and say to this kid and family, when you're counseling somebody who's overweight, you're like this teenager I was telling you before, the boy. You know, you're, you're this weight, you need to lose weight, you know, this is where you're at, this is what you need to do, you're not going to get the buy-in, all right? You're just not. We have to meet the family and the kid where they are and try and figure out what's going to motivate them and support them in the decisions they want to choose to make changes in healthy, healthy eating or activity. So that's really, really important. Um, I tell parents, and I, I would encourage all of you who are in this field, don't label foods. You know, when you, when you talk about good foods and bad foods, of course an eight-year-old who's eating a bad food, guess what? They feel bad, right? They've been told this is a bad food. So I call it, I often tell, talk to kids and families, I say growing foods, energy foods, all right? Foods that might slow you down. But I also am very clear with kids and families, we are not about never having the treats and the you know, rewards and all that. It should not be about you know, eliminating certain things. So um, I really try to make families understand that. Um, we want to follow natural cues for self-regulating. As I said, that portion distortion can be an issue for some families. And so really trying to have them you know, parents understand what are their cues for being hungry and full, especially when they're young. And teach families and kids how to critically view media, all right? There are um, trainings on this that are available to help kids and teens. What, what's advertising, you know? What are these messages? Why do they, you know, show that uh, soda drink and the kids, you know, bouncing and jumping and can run higher, or run faster, whatever, you know? These are marketing things. What's the ploy? What's the, you know, what are they trying to get you to do? Teach them to be smart consumers. And again, teach parents not to talk about their weight, their diets. Um, don't put inappropriate pressure about food and body and all these types of things. Um, I think that that only does harm in the long run. And then understanding stress. Um, there, I hope probably some of you are familiar with the ACE study, the Adverse uh, Childhood Experience Study. So, Kids who have been more um, exposed to adverse childhood events like violence in the home, um, divorce, uh, abuse, uh, you know, they live in poverty. I mean, they have a whole list of many things. They actually have higher risks of adults of being overweight, but in addition, they have higher risks of a lot of diseases, a lot of autoimmune diseases, cardiovascular events. So we really want to work with families to understand that food should not be a way to deal with stress. Okay? And again, just yesterday I had a kid, and that's the whole thing. I, you know, it's so funny. I, I do my interview with the parent and the teen in the room, and then I excuse the mother. And I always ask them, I said, so, you know, what's your stress these days? Anything that stresses you out? And she looked at the door, she goes, my mother. <laughs> that was it. And, you know, and we talked about it. And, what she told me, though, was she said, because she is a little overweight, she said, I eat when I'm stressed and my mom stresses me out. I said, well, that's not a good thing. Maybe we need to find some other ways for you to deal with your stress. You know, so we talked about some other techniques. So, you know, these are things you can really help people with, is understanding where that stress comes from and then how are helpful tools to kind of deal with that stress. That's really, I think, what's so key. And it is a balancing act. You know, we live in a society, as I said at the beginning, you know, and that you know creates mixed messages around food and how we want to look and how we want to be. And we as health professionals, you know, we want to try and avoid unhealthy emphasis on these things, okay? And be very, very balanced in how we're looking at this. And I probably treat many of my families very differently based on what I'm seeing and what I'm hearing. Because I'm not telling every kid that comes in who's a little overweight, oh, you need to, you know, you're overweight, and you, need, you know, I'm listening to a whole story. 
and if there's behaviors that I think I can look at that can target without putting emphasis on the weight issue and all that, then I feel, and they're willing to look at that, then that's something positive. So you have to really look at how you're looking at this. And we also need a shift in our community. Um, I think that with the increasing prevalence of obesity, we've certainly seen, I got a call from a school nurse once, that she noticed all her seventh grade girls were not eating at lunch. They were just all restricted. And it became a little club of restriction, okay? Why was that? Because they had just done health class to talk about weight and, you know, eating healthy and all these other things. So, yes, the message should be there, but how does that get taken and incorporated? And, and how do we, again, create that balance of a message that doesn't create more problems than we start out? Um, if you want more training, there's lots of websites and resources. Um, there's lots of meetings on eating disorders. We have our own chapter here uh, called the International Association of Eating Disorder Professionals. Um, we have a San Diego chapter, and they basically often do kind of educational meetings, also networking. And um, the Institute for Childhood Health, one of the things in, uh, that I wanted to mention is they created a new app. It's called Change Talk. So if you go to your Apple App Store, you can find this. And it's a way to do motivational interview for kids and families uh, who are overweight. So it's kind of kind of talks you through with an avatar. It's kind of neat. So um, it is something that uh, we're trying to get out there to pediatricians to be able to use. So it's at least done in a healthy way. Okay, so that is my talk, and I would you know love to entertain any questions or any comments or anything else that uh, people want to share. Yes. <laughs> Recovery. Yes. Um, and I put it in quotes. <laughs> is, it, is it the same kind of recovery as substance abuse that it's always ongoing forever? Yeah. I, I would say so, and I have some of my therapists here from our house, but I, I, I think it's quite similar. Um, there's always risk of relapse, um, and uh, it's, it's a definite mindset that's very difficult to erase, you know, once it's been there. So. Eating disorder folks to and connection. In a hypothetical situation where you have maybe a family that's similar or that has a generation of stereotypes, how would that be fine if this person just has a good one? Yeah, and that is an issue. You know, because we have graphs that we are supposed to, as pediatricians, we're trained, look at the BMI, look at the graphs, figure out are they in that 85th to 95th percentile or over 95th percentile. We have very specific things. But I'm going to tell you I don't follow them all the time because I do look at that. And you do have to accept that a boy who's an athlete who's muscular, he's probably going to have a higher body mass index, and we wouldn't want to put him in that overweight category. And in addition, with some of the island culture and things, you have to also look at that. I also am really clear to look at what's going on with the curve, the weight curve with kids, because there's a certain trajectory that we often see, and they may always be on the high side, and I'm not willing to change that for a kid or a family, okay? But if I see a trajectory that suddenly takes a huge climb up or down, um, then I'm going to sort of explore what may have happened. What is there stress? Is there something else going on? What is the kid that is deemed as unhealthy if he's a functional large family right. with genetics? Yeah. And so he's, we're talking a 17 year old, 17, 18 year old kid right. that's just huge. Right. And he's still in the way he's still Right, genetic. right, right. That would be tough to say. How do you rate that? And, you know, we could look at things like their lipids and uh, blood pressure and other things. And there is a uh, group, I'm uh, just getting their name, uh, Body Talk, you know, Body, they, they're really promoting that healthy at any weight. That's, I think, what's what they call it, healthy, healthy at any size. Is, it, is that what it is? Health at any size. Health at any size, that's it. So it is an organization that does look at people who are, quote, in that overweight category by numbers but they're still healthy, and there are people like that. So it is something that we know is very possible. And if an 18-year-old if comes in and he's eating healthy, he's 
you know, exercising, yeah, I'm going to be a little less worried about it, okay? Um, especially if there's not a lot of family history risks, other things like that. Okay. Um, you mentioned um, children with Asperger's having, what, like, if that's new to me, we see a lot of children on the PD scale, so what do you think that, I mean, is it the rigidity in there? I think it's the rigidity, maybe Dr. Namdar, because she's, she's a psychiatrist. We shared a couple. <laughs> Sometimes we really have to work with them to increase their calories and do a lot of that. Yeah, that is something that's a little different problem. And these kids often, you know, most of the time don't have the, I got to lose weight. They want to get me to keep eating. I have another question. Uh, eating as a gratification. so many different things, you know. It's A, our society, that we're in a hurry and we're off and on to the next thing. Um, and that, uh, you know, it's, I'm sure, I, I guess I would say, yes, it probably is a little bit of that. Yeah, yeah. Get ready to get another, yeah. Filling up. Not filling up. And that is something we talk about when we're trying to slow them down, that that signal takes about 15 minutes to get up to your brain to say, I'm full. And when you're eating fast, you don't allow that recognition. And then, of course, you know, after they have their seconds or thirds and they're really full, you know, and I talk about that as being Thanksgiving Day, so, you know, you're a 10. And you don't need to be a 10 all the time, so. I just one more question. In regards to the puberty, you're talking about girls? Yes. Yeah. Uh, you know, there can be many things. I mean, we've seen things like they've been sexually abused, so they don't want to become a woman because then that would make them be recognized as a woman. So that can be part of it. There's something called Peter Pan syndrome where some of these girls just don't want to grow up. They just want to be little girls, you know, and they want to live in their own fantasy. So, you know, they, there, there's some avoidance. They don't want to get a period. They don't want to have all that happen. Yep. Uh, what type of eating... Uh, Program that you put these kids on when you do find they have issues. So basically, what do you recommend them? I heard like myself. I heard like diets as far as like um, basically your blood type. You know, mm -hmm. I mean certain things that nature. Have yeah. you heard that before as well? Well, you know, again, I kind of I don't have a specific thing. Okay. I, I really look. I try to see first of all, are they eating fruits and vegetables? I do try to encourage if they can do half their plates and fruit. Uh, meals and snacks being fruits and vegetables, that's a, that's a good way to start, okay? So I'll talk about that. I talk about screen time. We recommend less than one to two hours of recreational screen time a day. We recommend, you know, more activity. So we call this 5210, and actually if you go, if you're interested, if you go to 5210, let's go. I think it's a whole campaign around these messages. So five is five yeah. servings of fruits and vegetables. Two is two hours or less of screen time. One is one hour of active physical activity every day. 
and zero is zero sweetened beverages. Okay. okay. And it's a simple message. You know, the schools can use it. It's not promoting, you know, weight loss, calories, you know, count this, count that. Okay. It's just sort of encouraging some lifestyle things that okay. we know are healthy habits to kind of start with. Okay. So that's a really good way to start. Um, other things that I sometimes will do, I'll look, uh, I, I have a list that I kind of have from some other website, um, and this works pretty well for kids. It's called red light, yellow light, green light. So basically, yeah, I tell kids, you know, green lights, you know, circle all those foods, yellow, and I always tell them, don't avoid the red foods, have them, but just realize how often you're having them, you know. And, and so I really try not to promote, like, okay, we've got to restrict, we've got to do anything, and I really don't count calories with kids. So. Okay. What do you think about the blood type diet? What do you think about that? I don't think there's a lot of research to support that yeah. that's really uh, an Efficient. absolute, yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, I think it's going to obviously have you make changes, mm -hmm. you know, regardless of it, but I don't know that it's scientifically okay. ingrained to say that it's a worse. I know, yeah. Diet for your blood type or something like that. Yeah, yeah. Eat, your eat your blood type. That's it. Yeah. What do you think about kids who um, neglect to eat to listen to something they want from their parents or to avoid punishment? Yeah. Well, then you know you have some real issues going on. You know because um, they're using food as a way to get to their parents, and that is not a good thing. So really, that is something that needs to be sort of flushed out from the parent-child interaction to say. Okay, but how else can we deal with these issues? Because um, there's obviously something going on. And, you know, parents who constantly reward with food, you know, all these kind of things. It's just creating that whole um, element around food that why it's so important. So, Do you recommend um, a specific website for parents to look at and to look at, like, signs and symptoms and suggestions? Yeah, um, the... I'm trying to think. What do you... Do you have... Nita is probably the best. Okay. Yeah, yeah. Okay. So that's uh, that's up there. But I think it's neda.org. Mm -hmm. yeah. Pretty sure. So Got it. Yeah, thank that, you. That, that would be probably yeah. good information. Yeah. And there's another one that I know, Mirror Mirror, that has a lot of information for families um, on Mirror Mirror. Yeah. I think it's Mirror Dash Mirror or something. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And they have a lot of information. And I have them. another question about, um, I guess, really? case sources for different, you know, for different. Um, treatment centers like yours, um, do you know which treatment centers um, accept things like Medi-Cal and Medicare so that, you know, if we have yeah. clients with that case source, they make yeah. the appropriate referrals? Usually from what I understand, and maybe you guys would know too, is uh, it's, a, it's a single case agreement. So okay. we have had some kids who come through our Medi-Cal, but it has to be applied for as a single case agreement. So it can be done. So. What's that? It's, it's difficult. Oh. We've, we've had maybe two. Okay. Yeah. 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 There are some scholarships out there sometimes, so sometimes that can be researched. The scholarships for treatment of eating disorders, so there are you know, foundations for that. It's a lot, but it's you know, worth browsing for. Yeah.